Welcome everybody to session six of Beers with Engineers. Um, looking forward to a great call today. Uh, as usual, um, we're pretty relaxed, so um, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to come off mute and jump in and ask. Um, if for some reason we didn't get a chance to allow you to unmute yourself, just raise your hand and we'll make sure we get that for you, okay? so. Uh, as usual, we'll start off with this safe harbor notice, right? Some of the things we may discuss may be not released yet, uh, maybe forward-looking things, so uh, don't make any financial decisions based on any of the conversations that we're having here today, certainly not when it comes to stock. So, all right, so we'll, as usual, again, as, you, as, as is normal, <clears throat> we're pretty informal, so um, short, sweet agenda, as always, um, but let's always go back over why are we here and, and what's the goal of the calls here, right? Uh, the most important thing is uh, there are a lot of our customers in the ServiceNow space who are moving into cloud native capabilities and containerization. And um, we, uh, both Will and I kind of felt like there's, there's um, not enough resources, especially not enough community building in that space. So we wanted to pull this together to give everybody a place to uh, learn from each other, learn from the stuff that Will and I are doing, and then um, talk and continue to grow. So, who we are? Um, my name is Mike Gallagher. If you haven't met, uh, if this is your first time, uh, welcome. I really appreciate you coming and joining us today. Um, <clears throat> as it says, uh, I've been in the IT industry for a super long time and have, uh, if it has a one or a zero in it, I've probably touched it or managed it in my career. Um, most recently, Kubernetes has become a really big passion for me, um, so that's a big reason why I've uh, uh, been working with Will to, to run the sessions. Um, but aside from that, uh, I love playing board games. Um, I love um, music. We were actually just talking about uh, going to shows before the, the, the session kicked off today, um, and I train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so I love that stuff. Hey, Will, over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, Will Hallam, uh, ITOM architect. I've been in IT for a couple few decades. Uh, currently focusing on automation with a particular concentration in uh, cloud, which has uh, more and more had its fingers, its its tentacles into the, the Kubernetes world. It seems like it's a becoming more and more a uh, ubiquitous topic. So definitely spending a lot of times, a lot of time on Kubernetes related topics. And my spare time, I like hanging with my family and playing video games and pickup hockey. And per our, the title of this series, I will be cracking open a long trail, little anomaly IPA, a delightful uh, light low calorie IPA, which still retains a, a nice hoppy taste, which I appreciate. And as usual, I forgot to introduce an open my beer until after Will reminds me to do his. Uh, so I am actually have been so much in love with these Admiral Abyss that I'm going to have another Admiral Abyss this month. Um, it is a chocolate milk stout from Odd 13 Brewing, which is a, a local brewery here in, in Colorado. And uh, they always have like the best art on their cans. So uh, super big fan. Nice. All right. Hey, I'll throw up a quick poll just to kind of get the uh, check a temperature on the room. Um, so the, the, it's a brief poll just with a couple questions around uh, container or container image scanning, since that's a big topic that Mike will be going into, specifically how we integrate with uh, a popular container vulnerability, <clears throat> excuse me, vulnerability management solution. So if you have a few seconds to fill out that poll, I'll just kind of leave it for a little bit. Back over to while, you. While we wait for that, why don't we have our esteemed guest, Linda Schinkel, come off mute and introduce herself um, and then talk about how we got here. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, Linda Schinkel, I'm a platform architect with ServiceNow. Been in the uh, IT world for comparable amount of time, 20 plus years, and um, actually live in Colorado, um, 
by Mike. So we've worked together for quite a few years, I guess now it's been, um, but yeah, I'm working with one of my customers and Mike's my go-to right on um, anything cloudy to use your term. And um, so we're uh, got a customer that was asking for some help with assignment group relationships to vulnerabilities that are being related to containers. They were using Prisma as a vulnerability scanning tool. Yep, there's the problem statement right there. So, you know, the key thing, um, and this was kind of an interesting thing, and, and <clears throat> the reason why we're all here today is actually because um, they came to Linda and said, hey, here's, here's this problem, here's what we're trying to solve how how can we help do this and and because linda's a platform architect that's assigned to work with this customer um she's incredibly familiar with the platform and with their particular um configurations and how they work and how they operate and so she reached out to me and said hey what do you think about this how can we get this working and i immediately said this sounds amazing i think this is going to be a really really good project for sort of end-to-end -end scope um, especially because it's so powerful from a use case perspective. So I think um, let's let's dive in and see what we can do. So um, Will has uh, ended the poll. Let's go ahead and share the results. All right. So go ahead, Will. Um, so it looks like about half and half in terms of um of the respondents, 50% are planning to scan containers and or images, but haven't launched uh, any initiative yet. And then um, the other 50% are actively in the middle of implementing. Um, and then in terms of An overall approach, 50% third party tool, 50% not currently investigating. Um, so I guess that probably aligns to the 50% that have plans to do scanning, but just haven't really set a direction or started uh, implementing yet. And then in terms of an approach, um, looks like current plans are of the 50% who responded current plans in terms of tracking the, you know, actually tracking, okay, we know this vulnerability is out there, but who's responsible for remediating them? And when is that remediation completed? That kind of thing. Um, they're indicating that they're using some separate third party or, or a, a potentially an internally developed tool to track the actual work that needs to take place in order to resolve the vulnerabilities once they're identified. Makes sense. So, uh, Linda, I'll let you kind of give the rundown on the solution, and then I'll talk to, like wind into the deep dive of kind of how it all went. Yeah, sure. So we started to look at the um, at the data and found that we had container uh, vulnerabilities or CVITs coming in from that um, Prisma integration, and they were uh, relating that vulnerability to the Docker image CI. Um, which at first glance, my customer was confused about and thought that it should be maybe down into the um, instantiated um, containers. And after talking with them, really deciding that the owner of the vulnerability really should lie in that image that produced the, the uh, container because that's where the vulnerability came from. Um, there, there was a use case that we had previously to this one that introduced the uh, common service data model, technical service, technical service offering and CI group um, or assignment group synchronization, that capability that came out quite a bit ago. And so the, my customers used to using that. So what we've decided is that every Docker image CI now has a new compliance or a new requirement within the CMDB to, to own a technical service and technical service offering relationship and then we will use that relationship to assign the um, CVIT to the appropriate group to uh, resolve. Perfect. So 
that's a, a really good kind of overview of what it looks like, but I want to take a step back and talk about how vulnerability response works on the ServiceNow platform. And then I'll quickly jump into the, um, uh, the Prisma um, integration and what it does. And then I'll kind of show the the end to end data flow and ownership. So um, the first thing, the way the vulnerability response works is we have various different vulnerability scanners, right? In this particular case, we're talking about Prisma Cloud, but it supports tons and tons of different stuff. But it goes in and it creates those vulnerable items based on what it finds in its scans. So in this particular case, um, what Linda was mentioning are those CVIS, the container vulnerable items that were created on the ServiceNow platform. And then because we have all of this information in the CMDB and we know kind of how it's all interrelated, we can prioritize that based on the business risk, right? Business, you know, the threat and what the risk context are, is for those applications. And so then we can assign that out to the appropriate teams in order to be able to say, hey, this is your vulnerability. You need to go and manage it. You need to go and remediate it. Um, there's also some, hey, this isn't my thing. We'll, we'll send it back and reassign it to the right team. And then um, that has a whole trackable workflow as, as is a standard with the ServiceNow platform. And then once it's been actually remediated, we now will not only have the task um, that says, hey, this has been completed and remediated, but the scanner also can go through and say, oh, oh, you know, this this is no longer a, you know, a vulnerable item, so it can automatically close those for you as well. So, so the whole process is really sort of managed from an end-to-end -end perspective via the the SecOps vulnerable re vulnerability response module, and that's um, not something we normally talk about here. But I, because this is such a powerful use case, I wanted to bring up sort of how it works and how how things work. Um, so let's talk about how the Prisma Cloud vulnerability scanning works in particular, right? So. Um, it's it, Prisma Cloud. Uh, if you've not heard of it, it's a, a an industry standard vulnerability scanning tool set. It has the ability to scan lots and lots and lots of different things for vulnerabilities, um, things like cloud configuration, things like your code repositories. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about the container vulnerabilities today. Um, it's it's an absolute market leader kind of in this space. Um, part of the reason why. Um, I've been involved with them and heard of them in the past was they acquired Twistlock a couple of years ago, which was a, a container security um, platform that was very, very useful and very powerful. So in, in this particular case, in this customer's environment, as part of every single um, build in their CI CD pipeline for container builds, the, the last step is, hey, this gets scanned by Prisma Cloud Compute and it looks for any vulnerabilities in that container image. And um, it can it has workflows and tiebacks into the ServiceNow platforms where it can like stop the build, it can stop things from being provisioned based on that, but that's not how they do it. They just say, hey, here's the list of vulnerabilities. And, and then <clears throat> what's interesting is it does it at build time, and in addition, it does it every night it scans all of those repositories that they have already in place so if during the day or a couple days later now the vulnerability database has been updated and things that looked okay a couple days ago now all of a sudden is a vulnerability and we have to be aware of it and so at night it scans that repository it finds that vulnerable item and then it creates it that vulnerability record within service now for the users to manage and and remediate the entire process and so and this is where um, the whole process gets very convoluted if not if you're not kind of clear on how things are going to work and where the data all lies and what the relationships are which is why uh, linda worked with with her customer to build out this design and understand kind of where the data flow is and what the relationships look like. And this right here is is really 
the power of the platform and how it builds out those relationships. So everything in purple is data that was built by the Prisma integration, right? In this particular case, this customer is using Azure DevOps. So that's the kind of lighter blue. Um, red is actually what's running in GKE. Um, and then uh, green is the data that's in the, um, in the CMDB, right? So Prisma, as it goes through and it builds those vulnerability findings, right? It scans the images and the blueprints inside of Azure DevOps, and it also ingests ownership and other kind of details around who's built that image and where it is. And then that information comes into ServiceNow as vulnerability entries and vulnerability images. And then there's these vulnerable items. Those are the CVITs that we were talking about. And those CVITs have relationships to records in the CMDB. So we're, we're discovering all of the information in their GKE clusters. Um, and this is something that we've, we've worked on with them over the last probably six months to a year. And we're discovering all of that information. And so that's all being populated in the CMDB. So we have the clusters that are there and those, and those pods that are running inside of that cluster. And those pods contain a Docker image, right? And those Docker images are, uh, are instantiations of a Docker container, right? But, in, but ultimately, the container repository has a repository entry that relates to the Docker image, right? So all of these relationships are all there and available. So when we go back to, hey, <clears throat> let's think about this from a, a reporting standpoint, right? I need to now find all of my vulnerable containers that might potentially have log4j, just to use a, a recent painful example, right? Um, I need to find all of the containers that could potentially have a log4j vulnerability. And so we can go and look for those vulnerable items. And then because we have relationships to all of the Docker images from those vulnerable items, then we can back from there into all of the running pods that have been instantiated from those Docker images. And then we can get to the owner, we can get to the application, we can get up to the business service that's consuming that application. So now we can do things like assessing our risk to the business services and the business capabilities based on what the vulnerabilities are that are running inside of those containers, right? So um, <clears throat> really, really, really powerful capability to be able to see all of that data from the the image that was built and what was vulnerable all the way out to hey this is actually running as multiple different pods right when you start to think about this if i have a a deployment that is um, running five copies of the exact same pod right then i now have five different containers and all five of those containers might have that exact same vulnerability so I need to understand, like, is my attack footprint this big, right? Or is it massive, right? Um, so a huge benefit to be able to have all of this data, have it all tied together, and really has helped kind of solve a problem for this customer. So a couple of things that I felt were important to call out uh, as um, things that we kind of bumped up against and... Um, <clears throat> want to share with folks so they don't run into those same pitfalls. So make sure that you're discovering your entire Kubernetes infrastructure, right? Because if I'm not finding all of my running pods and all of my other components, I won't have the necessary pods to be able to tie back to the Docker containers and the Docker running images. Um, so that's important. In addition to that, there's a, um, there's a pattern specifically called collect container repository that is enabled by default, but it's in some places I've seen it deactivated. If that's not activated, um, it's a it's kind of a sub pattern that's called by the Kubernetes patterns um, to be able to get the container repository information about the Docker images that the pods are running from, instantiated from. And so uh, it, that process helps to build the necessary relationships that the CVITs get tied to. So it's important to ensure that that 
uh, pattern is running and that it's going to work okay and that you'll get all the necessary data. The other important piece, and this is something that um, is really, really uh, important, is the, the, in, the ingestion of the data from the Prisma Cloud integration uses a scripted REST API to push data from Prisma Cloud into the ServiceNow platform. And then once it's in the ServiceNow platform, all the you know vulnerability response processes work perfectly fine. Uh, but that scripted REST API has some configuration necessary in order to um, ensure that the right matching is occurring so that we're not creating duplicate CIs for these container images. So some container images entries will have a, a prefix appended to them, um, which could cause things to not line up. And now all of a sudden, instead of having all the right relationships uh, you know, down to the right CIs, now we're having duplicates. And so that could be a potential problem and something to be aware of. And um, I provided a link to the documentation, which actually is out on the, the Palo Alto website um, that talks about how that scripted REST API is configured and how it all works. So um, questions about any of that and how that all works. I don't have a, a running environment to actually show you guys. Um, specifically because this particular customer preferred to remain anonymous and I didn't want to show their actual data. So um, I, I wanted to open up for questions, see if anybody had any thoughts. I have a quick comment. I, I've noticed that behavior you just talked about with the um, in the repo table or the image table where depending on how an image is discovered. Sometimes it's just like a SHA hash. Sometimes it's got like Docker D colon or container D colon, yep. and then the SHA hash. Um, and, and yeah, that's just kind of a recurring theme. We've got, uh, there's a POC exercise in which I'm participating where this customer happens to run a lot of, they're, they're all on-prem. And so their regular discovery, they, they have Kubernetes and raw Docker and they're, because all of their stuff is running on their servers, they are, can actually discover the Docker runtime kind of in parallel to the discovery that's happening from the Kubernetes API piece. Yeah. And so I anticipate they're gonna run into some normalization um, opportunities to avoid having kind of duplicate image records, one that comes from the Docker engine directly, and then one that comes from the, the Kubernetes. Because I definitely noticed between the two, there's the, the Kubernetes one is the, um, that's generally a little more descriptive where it'll say like Docker D colon or container D colon, and then the hash, whereas, um, Docker basically says, yeah, Docker is perfectly happy to give you like the little shorthand, not even the full hash. It just gives you like the little shorthand for the image. Um, so there, there's, depending on how heterogeneous uh, uh, the discovery sources are and the, um, and the environment is, you, you may have to make some adjustments there so that everything lines up and it's all normalized and you don't have duplicates. But once you've got that dialed in, the ability to map that all the way through, right? I go back and look at this. Um, the ability to map it all the way through from the vulnerability all the way down to how many containers do I have that are running this and what the, the business impact is, is, is really pretty powerful. Cool. Other questions? So, so would a best practice be to kind of be careful of the scope of your discovery if you have, you know, just plain old Docker out there while you have Kubernetes also, so that you're you're, you're kind of controlling what you're finding with the with the Docker only pattern. It would probably, I I, I definitely think that the more sources you have, the more good sources you have for your CMDB, the better off you are because it's less likely that you'll end up with gaps. Yep. Um, but from an implementation standpoint, I would definitely say don't turn everything on at once, like turn <laughs> on your Kubernetes discovery, make sure that's all stable. And then if you do have, you know, 
Docker runtimes that you're able to discover directly, then there's definitely value to doing that. Um, in fact, your question is kind of a nice segue because one of the things that I have prepared to show today is a little exercise I went through where I can actually interrogate uh, a Docker runtime for what processes are running inside containers, which is something unique. You, you have to own the server in order to do that. But we had a customer who asked for that. And so, um, you know, so that that's an example of where, you know, that Docker pattern can add value on top of the, the Kubernetes pattern for the, for the customer that happens to be, you know, running their own um, Kubernetes estate versus, you know, getting uh, Kubernetes as a service. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, you know, vanilla on-prem Kubernetes versus EKS or AKS or GK or something like that. Yeah, and I thought the I thought the catch too was is that you're not just running Kubernetes. You have just standalone Docker engines out there that are not part of a larger Kubernetes installation. Yeah, I mean that was the that's the scenario I'm dealing with um, right now is a customer that's got they've got Docker being managed by Rancher or sorry Kubernetes being managed by Rancher. They also have a bunch of raw Docker out there that they also want visibility into. Okay. Okay. Great questions. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns around how this all works? Okay. Cool. With that, I think we'll <clears throat> move on to the tech deep dive. And Will, if you want to steal a share, feel free. All righty. So as I alluded to, um, what I have today is a kind of a, a, a real life story uh, about a scenario that I've run into as part of a POC exercise. And this customer does have a diverse mix of containerized workloads. And one of the types of workloads that they'd want visibility into is just raw Docker containers. And, and so as we're going, as we've kind of uh, kicked off our, our POC and we started walking through some basic discovery and after running through the discovery schedules, they were clicking through different CIs and they clicked through a server and noticed that on, a, you know, and I'll just kind of do that just to make it visual. If we pick a, you know, for example, a Linux server, those of us who uh, are familiar with browsing through CIs will find the, uh, you know, the tabs that populate at the bottom of a CI record familiar. And, you know, in addition to the exhaustive relationship information, we've got these tabs down at the bottom, one of which is running processes. and. <clears throat> And so then they moved on to a container CI, which was being produced by the, the Docker pattern. And they brought up the record and, and looked at it and said, well, this, this is nice, but uh, we really would like to have that, that running process tab as well. So we can see what's running inside, um, inside the container and then potentially you know, carry it further and do app discovery in addition to some of the other approaches that they're talking about, which are, um, you know, pulling uh, SBOM software bill of materials from the images themselves, which, you know, Mike kind of alluded to the fact we've got all of that information. We've got every image that's in your environment that ServiceNow has discovered populating a container image table in your CMDB. And, and so from there, what we're looking at is to then go through and pull uh, software bill of materials for each of those container images and, and kind of fully fleshing out the CMDB to embrace the containerized side of things to the same level that we've done with the server side of things. Um, but that's so that's another, you know, that's another aspect of the POC that we're looking into. But their initial ask was, well, can we just get some running processes? for our containers. And um, when they asked, I wasn't really sure at the top of my head because that wasn't something that I had done routinely. 
most of the container type work I do is in the Kubernetes space. And uh, so I don't tend to spend a lot of time right down working directly with the container runtime. But a quick uh, perusal of the, the Docker documentation revealed that there is a Docker uh, subcommand, which is top, that you can use against a given Docker container to get a process listing. And it takes all the same arguments as the Unix PS command. So that with that piece of the, the puzzle kind of solved, I then just looked at the uh, out of the box Docker pattern and saw that it was already, as, just as part of what it already does, it's making extensive use of the Docker CLI. It just ex executes various CLIs to pull back payloads having to do with what containers are running, what images are on the system. And then, um, so then the, the next challenge that I had was, well, how do I, um, how do I pull back the information that I'm looking for and kind of set it aside so then I can align it with the different containers that are running on the system? Uh, if you're not familiar, if you haven't played around with editing patterns, one of the, the basic aspects of a pattern is it wraps everything it, it doesn't have it doesn't really have the ability to do a discrete kind of for for loop where you say pull a bunch of stuff in and then iterate through it and um and do a, a particular action on it. it it kind of the way it approaches it is through various transforms and um long story short it was it was not it, it was not straightforward from a drag and drop perspective to just say yeah loop through all these processes that i'm finding on this um I'm finding on this container and then just stick them in there with the rest of the container information that you're already pulling out of the box. So I, I did a little more research and, and came across this extremely useful feature of our discovery system, which is called uploaded files. And the uploaded files mechanism allows you to create any kind of a script that you can then that the discovery system will then upload to the dis the ci that's being discovered and allow you to execute and then produce a payload which you can then pull back right in line with your pattern so what i did was i just created a couple quick python scripts to enumerate information about my docker containers so the first one I created was, I just called it Docker PS, and it just um, it just does a Docker PS command and pulls back each of the container IDs, and then it loops through those and runs Docker top against it with a specific format, pulling back the PID, P, PID, and the, the full command string. Then it does a little more parsing of that and then provides that as a payload back to the pattern. And then uh, just a little preview, I, I kind of moved on once I got the, the process listing working and now I'm, I'm working on a way to enumerate the software that's actually running, you know, the software package inventory that's running inside a given Docker container. Uh, and I'm just doing that right now using the experimental Docker SBOM, um, software bill of materials subcommand that you can install as a plugin. And that's, uh, it, it, it's pretty slick. It, it actually, it's based on a, a popular open source project called SIFT, which is a very powerful image inventory tool, which it literally just perform. It's basically like running an RPM listing against a server, except on a container image, it just dumps out a whole list of uh, RPMs or, um, you know, APT packages, DEB packages that are built into a given container image. So once I had my scripts and uh, tested them out to make sure they produced the output I was looking for, I just kind of inserted them at applicable spots inside the uh, in, inside my copy of the out of the box Docker pattern. So 
the pattern designer includes a, a put file operation. So you basically just say put file, you select a file from the list of uploadable files. And then you assign the location that it gets stored in to a temporary variable in the pattern. And then at the opportune time, I invoke that script. In this case, I do so after the, uh, after the image uh, metadata is pulled down. I think that was kind of a little arbitrary. I clicked for some, if, if anybody knows a way to like pick up a pattern step and move it, um, feel free to let, let me know either live or, or send me an email because um, ideally I'd wanna arrange these steps a little more logically, but I have yet to find a way to like, you know, you think you could kind of drag and drop these steps kind of like with a uh, flow designer, but pattern designer doesn't seem to want to do that. So um, some of my steps were not in the order I would have optimally arranged them in, but I just didn't want to have to recreate the um, recreator, have to copy and paste it to a different spot in the order. Anyway, um, so this uh, parse command output step just invokes my uploaded script. And then it parses out my uh, it parses out my information. I kept it really simple. Um, your options with regard to you know, parsing data are um, within pattern designer kind of rigid. So I just kind of kept things really simple because this was a quick prototyping exercise to turn around and provide something to show the customer within you know within a couple of days. Uh, I'm not sure if my debug mode is still running. I'll just click the run command on the off chance that it is still connected, just to kind of illustrate what comes back. So uh, I chose, I just chose the at symbol as a as a fairly viable delimiter, just because it didn't seem to show up in process listings uh, very much or at all. So for my kind of initial POC use case. It was easier than like a, a colon or um, I had all kinds of trouble trying to get backslash as a delimiter because that's a reserved character in so many languages. So this is what I ended up with. And it just kind of pulls each line from the process listing with the container ID prepended to the beginning into a table that's now accessible to my pattern. And then it saves that data until after it populates the Docker container step or the Docker container table in step 53. So this is the out of box step that executes and it, um, I'm gonna cancel this because debug mode can sometimes go out and do its own thing for a while. So this is the out of the box step that populates the uh, Docker container table. And so rather than mess with that, I just added a step after that, which then takes the output of my uploaded script, loops through it and looks for anything with the current Docker container ID prepended. And when it finds a match, it just adds that to a big string, which it's gonna store in this really handy column that seems to exist in a lot of our CMDB columns, uh, CMDB tables, it's called attributes. Um, I didn't do an exhaustive search to see what it's used for, or where it's used in the CMDB, but I did look at all of my Docker container CIs and they all had nothing in that field. And so it's an out of the box field. It holds up to 64K of data. So it seemed like a good um, field to kind of co-opt at least for the uh, extent of this, this quick exercise, there's no reason you couldn't create a, a, custom, uh, a custom attribute. So the reason I did it this way versus trying to push the running processes directly from the pattern is I haven't quite figured out, I've gotten as far as finding out that conceptually you should be able to update basically any table from within a pattern. Uh, what I haven't cracked is exactly how you do that for something that doesn't start with CMDB CI. Um, 
with something that starts a CMDB CI in Pattern Designer, you just define a variable that matches the name of the pattern of the table. And then at the end, it bundles it all, all up in a nice uh, IRE payload for you and, and sends it along. And your table is magically updated. Uh, when I do the same thing for a table name that does not begin with CMDB CI, so the running process table starts with just CMDB, it's CMDB running process, uh, it populates the table just fine within the pattern designer, but it never ends up in the actual table. Hmm. So um, again, you know, short kind of I had a, a short time frame in which to work. I just kind of exercised the workaround. So I just just sorry. Do you have a question? No. Nope, that was me. Oh, okay. Um, didn't spill your beer. I hope. No. Okay, good. That's that's the most important thing. Right. Um, so what I did instead was I just took advantage of this empty field that had 64K of storage allocated to it. And I just dumped the process listing into that field so that if I go to a container, oh no, it's just plain old container. So if I go to my container listing at the top is my, my kind of my test case. And you can see it's got a whole bunch of stuff in this attributes column, which corresponds to the process listing that was discovered by my custom script there. And, and so that's where the pattern kind of hands things off. The pattern populates the CNDB CI container table and kind of seeds it with process listing information in the attributes column. So the way I kind of close the loop and get that information into the table I really want it to belong in is I use another really cool discovery feature. Called pre-post processing. Pre-post processing allows you to kind of inject, uh, inject special behavior before or after the payload is processed by the IRE. So I created a, a post script called container processes and I set it to run post sensor and the script is automatically provided a full, you know, it's basically provided the full payload such as it's delivered from your pattern. And then I just created a loop to kind of loop through it and for any Docker container record that's included in the payload, I pull out the attributes. And if they actually have something, if it has something in it, then I just kind of go through and parse that out and then generate the running process record for each of the processes that are found on my container. And so the end product of that, such as it is currently, if I click into my raw Docker container that I've got here, is now I've got a running processes tab for my Docker container that contains a reasonable facsimile of a Unix process listing. And so uh, we haven't got back together with the customer since we were meeting with them. They said, hey, could we do this? So um, I don't really have feedback as to how what, what they think of it. But um, I mean, it seems pretty similar to what we got in the server side. And it wasn't um, other than wrestling with some, some syntax things, which are always uh, just uh, quite the adventure sometimes with JavaScript and uh, Patterns also support Groovy under the covers. So some of the example code that I was looking at was written in Groovy. So that was that was a, a pretty cool adventure as well. I haven't really done a lot with Groovy. And um, yeah, so hopefully it's it's well received and, and kind of allows them to visualize what we call the art of the possible in terms of just showing them, hey, you know, with a couple hours of effort, here's something you could extend if you find that you know the out of the box gets you to the one yard line and you need to go that last yard to get to get the touchdown. 
questions? Okay, well, that's that concludes the tech deep dive of our segment. So, um, Mike, is are we just going uh, open forum at this point, or do we add of anything else that we wanted to uh, any anything else formal we wanted to cover? Uh, the only last thing really is um, uh, just the <clears throat> next session um is going to be september 22nd 4 p.m eastern um from a topic perspective i think we're actually working on a a log multiplexing solution um around doing log ingestion out of containers so um we're, we're working to finalize that right now and we'll get the invites out to make sure that you guys know about it well in advance but um i, I think it's going to be pretty interesting uh Okay, so now let's move it over. We'll open it up um, for Q&A. Uh, and this is the part where ask us whatever you want to ask us. If it's related to what we've talked about today, awesome. If it's, hey, I want to know about something totally different, feel free to ask that as well. And I'll, I'll stop the recording just so that um, folks can uh, feel more comfortable if... if uh, yeah, if you don't want your question immortalized on YouTube, then uh, exactly. we, we got you covered. Here we go. 